Hey there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. I've been having lots of fun with my Raspberry Pi Pico and I hope you've watched my previous video about how you can use C and C++ on the Raspberry Pi Pico. And I thought to myself, as you do, well, why don't I just put together a quick multitasking operating system for the Raspberry Pi Pico because the SDK gives a lot of good stuff. The Cortex M0 Plus is a very well-known processor and so hence was born Piccolo OS. So what I want to do is a series of videos about Piccolo OS, talking about how you can write a multitasking operating system for the Raspberry Pi Pico. And to do that, the first video, we need to talk about context switching. So this video is about context switching, the first in a series when ultimately we'll dissect and look at how I put together Piccolo OS. So if you want to find out more, please, please, let me explain. Okay, to start with, I do have a video which I recommend on multitasking, multiprocessing, and multi-threading. That would serve you well as a background to this because we are talking about a multitasking operating system. Now, when we're talking about a multitasking operating system, we're talking about having several tasks that can be running concurrently. And to us as humans outside observing, it looks like they're running actually in parallel, but in fact, they're not, they're running concurrently. And in my, here's an example showing you of Piccolo OS running on my Raspberry Pi Pico. You can see there's one LED, the internal one is flashing, but also there is an external one flashing at a different rate. Now they're both separate tasks as part of Piccolo OS. And here's a third task, which is giving output on the serial, which is calculating prime numbers. And so all three tasks are running Running concurrently in this multitasking operating system that I've called Piccolo. So context switching is a fundamental concept involved in multitasking operating systems. Now before we go on I do have some videos about how CPUs work. If you're not really familiar about how a CPU actually works maybe again you should watch those videos as a bit of background. In fact there is meant to be another video in that series I've never got around to making it maybe this will give me the kind of the, the you know the uh, the kick that I need to actually make that video. But let's have a look at the idea of what a CPU is doing when it's running a program on something like a uh, Raspberry Pi Pico. So here is a very simple uh, program written in ARM assembly language and it's showing you that uh, basically a CPU has registers and it also has memory. And all a CPU does is as it follows the instructions, it alters a register or alters something in memory. And as those state change, you know, different things can occur. So ultimately you say turn on an LED and that's changing something uh, to, to set the state as that line gets power to it. So an LED lights up. So here you can see move 100 into register one, move 100, 200 into register two add register one and two together and put the result in register three and, and so on. And the a CPU will execute those commands uh, one at a time. And when you've used a compiler or something like that to write a C program, it compiles that into uh, assembly, ultimately into machine code that is used by the uh, processor to run these instructions. Now let's say you wanted to run two programs concurrently. So here on the left we have some assembly language, here on the right we have some assembly language. They're very, very similar, uh, but they are actually different. So for example, on the first line we're loading 100 into R1 on the program on the left, but we're loading 400 into R1 to the program on the right. So how can you get the CPU to run both of these programs concurrently uh, next to each other? And the problem we have is that a CPU can only run one instruction at a time. And of course here I'm ignoring multi-cores and instruction level parallelism and things like that. But fundamentally, a CPU executes one instruction, then it moves on to the next instruction, then it moves on to the next one, and so on and so on. So here's a question, can we interleave between the two programs? Can we do move 100 into R1 on the left, then swing over and do move 100, uh, 400 into R1 on the right, and then swing back to the left, then over to the right, and back to the left and over to the right? Can we do that? Well, no, we can't, because if you just look at the first instruction, move 100 into R1, then the next instruction will execute from the other task, is move to 400 into R1. And then when we get back to our first program, Actually, R1, what is it? Is it 100 or is it 400? Because we put 100 in there and that will be important for whatever calculation that we're doing. And now actually the wrong number's in there. So the program will just fail. And obviously the more you interleave, that will just cascade into an absolute a, a, a dismal failure because you're interleaving two programs uh, together and trying to run them. And of course that will just end in a big stinking mess. Well, what about if we ran them kind of in batches together? So we could run move 100 into R1 and move 200 into R2 and then we can add R1 and R2 and put it into R3 then switch over to the other program move 
400 into R1. Well, that's okay, because we've already used R1 now in our adding it. So maybe that doesn't matter. Moving to R2, that's okay, it doesn't matter. Adding R1 and R2, now putting R3. And then we switch back over to the other program. But eventually, you'll get down to a point where you want to use R3 again. And which R3 is it? Is it the one from the program on the left or the program on the right? So you're just, again, you're interleaving. It's just you're not doing it one instruction at a time, you're doing it five instructions at a time or 10 instructions at a time, but ultimately you'll still end up with program errors that will just not work. So what happens if actually we ran it in small batches and every time we switched over to the other program, we saved the values of the registers in memory, ran the other program, and then when we switch back, we restore the values of the registers. So in fact, they're exactly as they were when we left off. And that's basically what context switching is. You can have multiple tasks that you want to run concurrently. And as you switch between them, you save the context, that means save the registers, so that you can then run the next program without worrying about changing the status of the other program. You then save those registers, and then when you switch back to the first program, you reload the registers from memory and say, well, here is where you were, so now carry on as you left off. Now, of course, the program doesn't mind. As long as you put 100 in R1, and when it carries on later on, 100 is back into R1, it doesn't care that you went off and did 500 other things and then came back here restored the value of R1 and then carried on. As long as when the program carries on, it is actually got the right numbers in the right registers where you left them. And so a context switch is the process of storing the state of a program so that it can be restored and execution can be resumed at a later point. And so here is a little diagram showing that we've got task one. When you move away from task one, you save the context. You then restore the context for task two. It runs a little bit. You save that context. You restore the context for task three. It runs a little bit. You save that context. You restore the context for task four. You save that context. And then you go back up to task one where you've restore the context again. And then you carry on and keep going round uh, in a circle. So of course the question is where do you save this memory? Well, a place that's often used uh, inside of assembly language program is a place called the stack. And it's what the process, the program that's running uses. It knows it can put temporary values there. And then when it pulls them back off again, they're gonna be ready for it to use. So the stack is really a quite an important concept in terms of assembly language programming. So let's have a very quick look at it. So a stack is a block of available memory that can be used to place values as a LIFO, last in, first out. And I talked about this in my last Pico uh, pr uh, video. So the top of the stack here has got 14 on it. Then below it is 13, 12, 11. It's like a stack of plates. So here there are four plates. 11 is the bottom plate. 14 is the top plate. Now items are pushed on like your stack plates. You put 11 down, then 12, then 13, then 14. But when you take them off, you take off 14, then 13, then 12, then 11. So you don't take a plate from the bottom. You take the plate from the top until you work your way back down to the bottom. And that's a LIFO. Last in is the first, is the first out. Now to know where the top of this pile of memory is, you have a think of the stack pointer. So it points to where the current top of the stack is, and then you can add more things on top, or you can take things off and move the stack pointer up or down accordingly to what you're doing. Now in a context switch, you want to save the registers, that means push them onto the stack, and then when you come back and you want to restore, you pop them off the stack. So you might store, uh, push on, R1, R2, R3, R4, and then you pop off R4, R3, R2, and R1, and then your program can carry on because all those registers have been restored to their original value. So now you can see we can have an area of memory, the stack, you can stack up the, ver the registers, then you can pop them off again, and that's a good way of restoring. Now, wouldn't it be good if the hardware knew that some programs want to run in this kind of context switching multitasking environment. Well, the good news is the Cortex M0 Plus, in fact, all the Cortex processors know exactly about multitasking and about context switching. And there's some stuff built into the hardware that makes it a bit easier for us. So the Cortex M0 Plus processor, and in fact, other Cortex processors have the idea of two stack pointers. There are two types of stack, the main stack, the MSP main stack pointer, and the process stack pointer. Now you can have multiple process stack pointers, but only one is active at a time. And the process stack, pro 
pointer is used by the current task, the current program that you're running. And the main stack pointer is used by the uh, operating system and for handling interrupts and exceptions. The stack pointer that you're using is determined by a special register actually inside the ARM assembly code. So in fact, the uh, Cortex M0, you can say to it, hey, your task number one, use this stack pointer. And what the advantage of that is, is that it, that's the stack pointer where you saved the registers earlier on. And when you go to task number two, you can say, hey, task number two, you use that stack pointer over there. And so you can have little bits of memory that are the stack pointers for the different tasks. And when you switch tasks, you don't have to say, oh, hold on, the values on that task are actually R1 and R2 for the other program. These are your R1 and R2. And every time you switch tasks, you switch the stack point and say, use over here, use over here. And the hardware handles that for you. Now, since we will be talking about the Cortex M0 in a bit more detail, when we come to look at how I wrote Piccolo OS, we need to understand one thing. The Cortex M0 processor has two modes. It can be in either thread mode or handler mode. Thread mode and handler mode are almost exactly the same. The only difference is in thread mode, if you desire, the process stack pointer can be used rather than the main stack pointer. And after a reset, the processor is in thread mode. So what that basically means is that inside the Cortex M0, you can say, hey, you're running this task over here and you're using this private stack to keep all your information on it. And then when an interrupt occurs, when an exception occurs, the, uh, the chip will automatically switch into handler mode and knows that at this point, because it's an interrupt, it's been interrupted in what it's doing by some outside event, even something like, you know, something appearing on the serial line, it can then jump to another program and it automatically switches to using the main stack. So it understands the idea of running in thread mode, where it's running your task, and in handler mode, where it's dealing with operating system type stuff. And that switch happens automatically when an interrupt occurs. And so if we look at the way Piccolo OS is put together, the OS itself, the kernel, if you want to, runs in handler mode using the main stack pointer. Task run runs in thread mode with its own stack, which I'm calling PSP1. Task 2 runs in its own in thread mode with its own stack, PSP2, and so on and so on. So you can see that with my program running with three things happening there on the screen at once, that's the LED flashing, uh, the other LED flashing, and the stuff coming out on the serial port, there are in fact four stacks involved. One for Piccolo OS itself, and one for the three tasks that are actually running. So four stacks in total, three of them are process stacks, and one of them is the main stack. And so the way Piccolo OS works in terms of context switching is Piccolo OS save, it runs, it saves the kernel state, that's R1, R2 for that kernel state, into the main stack. It then restores the uh, process stack for task one, it runs, it then saves its state back onto the process stack for task one. It then switches back into the kernel. The kernel then decides what is the next program to run, which in this case is going to be task two. Task two stack is restored. All the registers are put back to the way they were. Task two runs. When it, fin when it uh, go switches away, then its stuff is saved back onto its stack. Then the main stack is used again to bring Piccolo OS back into the execution. It's now running, choosing what the next pro pro task that's going to run is, using the main stack, and so on and so on. So it's always task OS, task OS, task OS, task OS, and the OS decides what is the next task that's going to run. Now in Piccolo OS, that's really simple. It just says the next task. There's no priorities, there's no queuing, there's no to say, oh, this one has been running, is, is re using all the resources, this one needs more resources, none of that stuff. It just says, you're the next task. That's the simplest way to do it. But the OS picks the task, then that task runs. When it switches away, then that saves its context, the registers onto its own stack, and then switches back to the OS. And this just keeps on going round and 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 round. Now we'll just talk very quickly a bit about the Cortex M0 again, because this is important. When an interrupt occurs, which could also, you could call it an exception, the hardware saves automatically some of the values onto the stack, and that's called an exception frame. After the interrupt has been processed, the code, need, of course, needs to return to normal execution. So you got interrupted because there was something on the serial port, you dealt with it, then you want to carry on running. Now, the way that the Cortex uh, knows that you've finished your interrupt stuff, the stuff that happened in handler mode, is that return address becomes 
F F F F F F F F D. And if you put that as the return address, then the Cortex processor knows this is a special situation. It switches back to thread mode and it switches back to the process stack that it was using before. So basically, the Cortex M processor can be running along in thread mode, doing your code, working out prime numbers, whatever. An interrupt occurs. <gasps> Something's happened. I better go off and deal with it. The processor then jumps over in handler mode using the main stack now, leaving the stack of your prime number program all nice alone and pristine, nothing touching it. It goes and does its stuff and then it goes, well, when, when do I know I finished? How do I know that I finished this stuff? And that's because you return to that special address. F -f 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 -d. And then it goes, ah, now I know I finished that and I'll go back to my process stack calculating those prime numbers and I'll carry on over there. Now we can use that to our advantage because we can say, well, when you return, go somewhere else. And this is the key. You can say when you return from the interrupt, don't go back to using your prime. In fact, go back to the program flashing the LED. And then when another interrupt occurs, you can say, okay, now that I've handled that, go return somewhere else, go back to the prime number program. So this fact that you can go into a handler that handles a priority, handles the exception, and then you can return somewhere else is the fundamentals of how you write a multitasking operating system. And so in closing, we'll just look at the main code for a demo that I put together. So basically you can see here, you've got the piccolo init command, sets up all the right stuff that you need for piccolo, prints out on the uh, serial port that piccolo S demo is running. You then create three tasks. One flashes the lead, the other flashes the other lead at a different speed. And the third one calculates the prime numbers. And then you call piccolo start, and piccolo start never returns, which is why the return zero there is never gonna happen because it never gets there. And so piccolo start just goes through choosing, switching, between those three tasks, uh, and that's it. You've got context switching and a multitasking operating system. Okay, before we go, I do want to mention that I do have a newsletter, the Gary Explains newsletter, comes out about once a month, covers everything I'm doing here on Gary Explains, everything I'm doing over on Android Authority, plus some insights into things that have been going on in the tech world. I really think you'll find it useful. Sign up at garyexplains.com, no spam, just the newsletter. Okay, that's it. So we've come to the end of this video about context switching. There are more videos to come about Piccolo OS. Do check out my GitHub repository. I'm starting to upload stuff there as I'm preparing for these videos. There is already a detailed readme file which talks about the design and the fundamentals of how Piccolo OS works. You might find that also useful. If you did like this video, please do give it a thumbs up. Also, please do subscribe to the channel. Don't rely on the YouTube recommendation algorithm because it may not have shown you this video. So the best thing to do is subscribe, hit that bell notification icon, and then you'll know every time I drop a new video. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.